All right, so I'm going to be talking about varnish and redis. I apologize, I did make this look super pretty. I didn't have time this week, so it's going to be pretty basic. Um, so varnish and redis, if you haven't heard of it, I'm going to quickly cover the, what they both are and then go into how this, or why I want to do this talk, and then how this looks into Rails. So first up is redis. If you haven't heard of redis, it's essentially just a key value store. It's an easy way to store this key equals this value. Pretty basic. So, here. So you've got a key, and it equals a value. So to interact with Redis on the console or through some sort of library, you say set this key to this value. And then to get that key, you say get this key and you get that value. Pretty basic. The part that will relate to my talk later on is how Redis interacts with uh, hashes. So kind of the same idea, but instead of a key equals a value, you say a key equals a hash and then you can traverse or access parts of that hash individually. So you say h set, which hash set, and then you give a key. Now in this instance, you can name keys however you want, so you can get kind of fancy on how you want to structure your, uh, your Redis keys uh, and how they relate to your application. So in this instance, I'm saying user colon and then the user ID. Just an easy way to visualize it, an easy way to, to put it together in your Rails application to access it. Anyway, so there's the key, and then I'm saying set access, which is the key to the key, key to the hash, and I want to say active is the value. So if I do h get the key, and then the key of the hash, I get active back. Hope that makes sense. It's kind of important to so the rest of the talk. All right, so that's, that's right. So it's, it's really good at doing this. It's super fast at writing all this information, and even faster at pulling it back out. Can you explain the access active? Again, you said it's important to understand the rest of it. Okay, so the key in this in this instance is the user colon one two three four five. So that just you can just replace that in your head with the key. Access is the key to the hash, or a key inside of the hash. So I could also say I could put ID here, and I could I could put one two three four five in there, just like a Ruby hash. I could say, you know, shove all these different uh, you know attributes in the hash, and then you know assign different values to them. That help at all. This so, doesn't look like it's in the hash. Yes, in the problems. So I'm saying set active as the value to that key of the hash. User colon one two three four five is the key of the top level key value. Yeah, it's a little weird. <laughs> and then that value of the top level is also a key value store, a hash. Can you switch to a terminal for a second and type hash left bracket. Access or something like that. I might know I can't. I did something where I never should Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe I'll figure it out. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Maybe. Like maybe. So you can also do like first name is Russ, last name is, is Smith, and you can access all the different versions or all the different keys in that hash. Is active a keyword or is that active? No, no. Active is the value. So if I do h get and I ask for what's what's the value of the access key, I get active value. Essentially, a multi-dimensional hash that's working. Yeah. Syntax. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So varnish. Um, so varnish is. Who's heard of varnish? Just out of curiosity. So, right. so uh, for the people who don't know, varnish is a reverse proxy cache. So if you want to scale your user base, um, or where I first heard about it, and I had to really figure out what it was, as I used to work for Card Player, and during the World Series of Poker, the site would just go down and go away. So we had to figure out a way to how do we how do we stand up during this and not spend a ton of money doing it. Um, so I found Varnish. Uh, at the time, there was only one other really good solution. It was sold by Oracle. It was like sixty thousand dollars per CPU per year. Um, so that wasn't really a viable solution. So Varnish is free. It's open source. Um, it's really really good what it does. So why do you use Varnish? It's really fast. It's stable and really low overhead. I've got a, essentially for my current job. And for at the time, we had one server serving up Varnish, and even during the World Series of Poker, you know, the load average on the machine would barely go over one. I mean, Varnish doesn't really care what the hell's going on. Somehow, it's able to keep up, um, and it's really stable. I've never had Varnish crash throughout my entire time of using it. Uh, supposedly, you can do twenty thousand requests per second. Even the World Series of Poker, we weren't quite doing that. Honestly, at my current job, I'm not doing that, but I'm doing a lot of just consistent traffic, and I've had no issues at all. And you can stop hitting your slow backend. So as we know, Rails can be kind of slow, especially depending on what you're doing. 
Um, and if you're really just serving up static content, stop hitting your, hitting your database for it. You can just serve it straight out of, uh, out of Varnish. And the way, so the way Varnish works is you make a web request. It hits the Varnish server. If it doesn't know about what that URL is, it will go to your backend, which in this case would be Rails. It says, give me this content. Content comes back into Varnish. Varnish saves that on its own, and then it spits that content back out. Round two, request comes in. Varnish knows about it now, and it spits it right back out to the client. So the backend never gets hit a second time until you invalidate that cache. It also really handles well what's called the dog pile effect. So like, say your homepage is it's really, really big, and you're doing a lot of queries. If you invalidate the cache, in a lot of, a lot of caching solutions, if you have 10,000 people try to hit your homepage, Rails is going to try to make 10,000 different requests to make this happen. Varnish says, OK, I'll take the first guy. I'll go and get that. Everyone else, I'm just going to serve you up the old version. And then once it has the new version, it will start serving up the new version of everyone else. So you, you really get a lot of benefit from that. Other nice plus is back to card player. Uh, we did have a slight issue. It wasn't, it wasn't Varnish related, but essentially we, we kill all our servers in the backend during the World Series. And um, we were actually able to keep Varnish up for 24 hours and look like we were up. Since most of the site was static, we were able to say, just go ahead and do it, uh, and we'll just disable login for now. <laughs> all right, so why put them together? So I talked about all this great stuff. So essentially, if your site is static, you're golden. I mean, if you're the Wall Street Journal and you can just serve up news articles all day long, you really don't have to do anything special with Varnish. You can just really, really just put it in front of it and just serve all your content. But, again, if you're the Wall Street Journal, or, yeah, the Wall Street Journal, you've got a paywall now. You've got to make some money. So you want the same URL, but you want to serve up something a little bit different if you're paying me money, or if you're not paying me money, or if you're on a trial, or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to explain this a little bit. So this is really the reason I want to give the talk. A couple of days before I volunteered for this, the company who uh, does the commercial support for Varnish, and, does all, and they pay the developers to work on it, they, they did like this big restructuring, and now they offer paywall as a paid service, but again, their license is $70,000 a year. <laughs> Wait, ridiculous. So I'm gonna show you how to do this for free. So I expect checks at the door. <laughs> so a paywall, so the idea is you pay me money, you pay me money, whether it's a subscription or you pay me for 30 days, you get access to content. So I wanna use Varnish because it's super fast and I can serve up content all day long and not have a whole bunch of servers. So I want to serve up something different on path to content.html, depending on if you're paying me or not. So Varnish has a way of using keys and values, kind of in a way. So you have to give it a hash. You have to build a hash for it so it knows what to use as the key for that piece of content. If you don't mess with it at all, it's just going to be the path to content.html. But if you want to get fancy, you can do a path to content.html, you can give it myhost.com if you want, if you're doing uh, 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 vhosts, and then you can give it that user access level that we're talking about, or whatever else you want to put as that value. Um, so again, you get multiple responses for that single URL. So the key to all this is if you can kind of generalize your users a little bit, if they're, you know, if they're a free person, if they're, if they're paid, uh, in my current company, I even have an access level called Pirate, and I serve you up some really funky content, because we don't like you. <laughs> so if you can do that, you can make this all the whole work. So putting it all together, how does this work with Rails? Okay, this is a lot of code. I'm going to go through all this a little bit slowly. All right, so the first thing, at least the way I've made this work, is you, you have to set cookies correctly. Uh, this is an example using device with Warden. You can make this work with any other sort of uh, system that's out there. Uh, so the big thing is right here at the top. We set the, we set the user cookie, and I just set it to the user ID. Then I take the second cookie and I do the Rails app token, which would be your name, the name of your app underscore token. And I create my own uh, cookie inside of that. So I say, I, I create a hex digest consisting of the Rails application's secret token, which is only known to hopefully the developer, and uh, plus the user ID. So using that, it just creates a really long random string. That's should be unique to that user. Um, and that will be used in the Varnish backend later. And then the second line, this is how Redis comes into play. So after the authentication, so after the user logs in, I need to set the access level for that user inside of Redis. 
So I don't know if this, this helps explain it a little bit more. So I'm saying set the access level to whatever it is you know, for this user comes from the database. And the reason you put it in Redis is it's just a lot faster than trying to hit the database all the time. Uh, and then before you log out, go ahead and clean it all out so they don't have access to that kind of stuff anymore. All right, so again, you can do this outside of device. This is actually great. All right, so again, a lot of code. I'm going to break it up. All right, so first part of this is this is a Varnish config file. They have their own weird DSL for the configuration files. And it really kind of sucks sometimes, but here it is. So you need to import Redis and then digest, and then you need to uh, connect to Redis. Um, pro tip, don't set your Redis to timeout, um, or Varnish just freaks out. It was, it, it was a bug I dealt with for a week. So make sure Redis is set to not kill client connections. All right, so essentially, this is like the, the bulk of what Varnish does right at the top of request. So this is how it builds that hash. So if you, again, if you don't touch it, it just takes that URL and uses that as the hash key. But if you want to play with it, it has this method called hash data. And you can call it multiple times. You see I'm calling it twice here. And you just keep calling it with the bits that you want to use for the hash. And then at the end, when you say return hash, it just takes all of that and, and puts, spits it back out. So we hash the URL, we hash the, uh, the host, because in my instance, I do uh, B hosts. And then if it's not a Git request, just hash, pass it right on back, because we don't, if it's a post request, we don't want to deal with it. We just want to push it back to the user. In that case, it just essentially bypasses Varnish. And then else, I'll be showing you the rest of that. Uh, and then we unset the cookie and the authorization. Essentially, you don't want to be sending cookies back to users that it's not their actual cookie. Um, since we're caching stuff, we just don't want that to happen at all. So we just upset those and set it back out. All right, so this is the meat of it. I'm sorry, this is a lot. All right, so right at the top, if it's a Git request and we have that token somewhere in the cookies, uh, we go ahead and we, we go into that block. So we grab the user ID from the cookies. Again, Varnish is a little weird. You can't just directly set variables. You have to like set it on the headers. So you set the xrail app user on the header, and we're just looking for that cookie, and we just we, we drop that in there. The next part we do is the same thing, but we do with the Rails app token, which is that user ID plus the secret token combined in a hex digest, and we spit it back out to them. And then we do it again here. This is how we validate that we're getting a, a proper request. I would actually like to know about people's security because this was just something that worked. Um, so I do it again here on the back end. And then down here, I take what they sent me, what I generated, and I make sure that they match. If they match, then I know I've got a valid request. If I have a valid request, then this is the whole, I mean, the whole point of this talk, the whole paywall, it's just one line, that's all it is. I go ahead and I set the access level with hash data, say that you also have to have this in there. Um, and that import Redis we did, if you do redis.call, you get the H, get the user, and that, the access key, you get the value back out of whatever access level they have. All right, so how does this all work with Rails? All right, so you have a controller, pretty basic. Um, you, you got your show, you go ahead and you find your article, and then uh, I just broke it out, a template for show. So if, uh, if they're not signed in at all, did I show? Yeah, okay, if they're not signed in at all, I'm just gonna show the excerpt, or Maybe I'll push them to a join page or something like that. And this is how you kind of access the, the levels of the user. Like I said, remember you were modifying the headers in Varnish. This is the one that we created in Varnish. It's not actually available as a header in a Rails app. So uh, if, if it's there, I could just return it. Um, I said that right? Yeah, okay, so production, essentially this takes it back over here, which would be like, there's a type that's a little bug. I didn't actually run this code, I just wrote it out. All right, so it would just return like member back to the render call. So it would be views, articles, member, .html, whatever. And just, uh, you create your different templates based on what you want to show the user. Uh, and for dev development, it's just nice to have this little fallback because this won't normally work in development, obviously. And your code will work essentially the same in development. All right, so that's my last slide. I forgot to add one slide. Uh, I do have a gem for all of this. Uh, it's called Lacquer. It doesn't have this feature built in, but I do plan on adding it at some point. 
Um, Lacquer's been used, obviously, by Card Player, my current company. Uh, it's been used by like, people by, uh, there were some Swedish horse racing website or something like that. Um, that, that poster is some, some fairly large companies that have actually used it and contributed back, and it's actually become a really good job. And I will probably add all this stuff to it. That's my time. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks,